good morning. Jackie Leonardo, can uh, can you hear me? Are we on? Yes, yes, I can, I can hear you. Excellent, excellent. Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, depending upon where you're joining us. And we want to welcome and express our gratitude to Leonardo Sampertegui, who is the General Legal Counsel at the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, better known as OPEC. It's late in his day in Vienna, Austria, and we're probably keeping him from uh, a, a, a delightful Wednesday evening there, summer evening in, in Vienna. So we, we appreciate him taking time uh, after work to join us to, to, to have this webinar. Um, so this is Jeremy Martin, and thanks for joining us. I'm Vice President of Energy and Sustainability at the Institute of the Americas. And we're, we're, we're always thrilled to have someone like Leonardo join us for our webinar series and, and sharing his thoughts and insights. But there's a whole host of other reasons, if you'll allow me to explain why this is even uh, more unique than, than ever. Um, number one, Leonardo is uh, Ecuadorian, and he's somebody we've gotten to know the last few years uh, as we've increased our collaboration with Ecuador and, the, and, and particularly the government of Ecuador on energy issues. And so many of you know, we just, uh, the Institute of America has convened a, a roundtable in Quito on July 25th. And, and we, we, we leaned heavily on Leonardo for some insights as we developed that, that program. So that's one cr uh, crucial. But then the other that I really want to highlight is Leonardo uh, is going to be a featured speaker and panelist at the inaugural Madrid Energy Conference that the Institute of the Americas is convening together with our partners at IPD Latin America. A little bit more on that later, but I just wanted to to indicate, um, in addition to all the important reasons why someone from OPEC should be talking with us and joining us on our webinar series, there's two other more recent and, and upcoming reasons why it's it's such a perfect occasion. So, on the one hand, we want to celebrate what we talked about in Quito and, and continue that conversation. On the other hand, we want to raise the curtain a bit on our event coming up in Madrid. Um, so, just if you'll allow me a little bit more, I want to sort of emphasize what we're going to talk about today. And uh, we put the agenda up here on the screen. We're going to do this a little bit different in terms of our webinar series today. We want to have a little bit more audience participation. There are, is not going to be a formal, formal presentation. That is no, uh, no slide deck with a series of slides that Leonardo will present. Instead, uh, I'll make a couple comments and introduce him. He'll have some brief remarks. And then we'll have a, a virtual panel. We'll have a virtual conversation. So I want to lean on everyone online today to join us and fire your questions uh, away. Just a reminder, we use the chat function for questions here. So if you look down in the uh, right-hand corner, you'll see where we post the word question. And that's where you guys can, during any moment of this panel and conversation with Leonardo Sempertegui, you can address a question. Uh, so the Institute of the Americas has, as like any other public policy oriented in, in, in institution and organization looking at energy issues over the last several years, begun to try and also uh, better understand the global energy transformation that's underway. And, and I think there's no doubt that there is indeed a, a major um, uh, transformation in, in what we're calling an energy transition underway in the global energy system that's driven by several different factors. And in fact, a lot of folks argue that the word should be plural, that it's actually energy transitions because there is a, a whole host of transitions underway, um, you know, affecting a, a variety of elements, but particularly structural changes. And what I would argue is the key piece of, of the energy transition, uh, what the dominant fuel source and how we produce and consume energy from those sources. So in, I guess, simpler terms, it is really a transition from a decades old, some may argue a centuries old uh, system and energy economy or economy based on energy that was derived from fossil fuels uh, to one that's increasingly uh, less reliant and reducing the role of fossil fuels. Um, and we're going to have a conversation with Morgan Brazilian here in a couple weeks at the Institute. And he's argued that there's a, a whole host of other factors such as technological innovation, climate change mitigation policies and geopolitical developments that we must consider when we discuss the so-called energy transition. Um, he further states that energy systems have always been in transition and that the sophistication of existing technological systems, global dimensions of energy trade, sunk investments, and the urgency of climate change determine the complexity, scale, and pace of our current transition. And I, I definitely want to emphasize this last word, pace, and I also want to emphasize something else he mentions, which is the geopolitical developments. And that's where I think it brings us all to, uh, to, to the importance of having someone like Leonardo Sempertegui and the role and his role at OPEC 
to share with us because we can all agree that the under the under transition is underway but at what pace what is the timeline when will certain things occur and, and can we say with any uh, certainty that they will occur on uh, under a certain timeline by 2020 by 2050 there's all kinds of different uh, analyses and projections but i think the, the the question of pace is is very much in doubt whereas the question of the transformation and transition is not um, and that brings me to the other point and, and i'll end with this the global governance the global energy governance and the international organizations institutions that have come to dominate the last uh, 75 years, really the post-World War II economic and global environment, uh, has seen OPEC be a major, major driver of debate and policy uh, in terms of international energy affairs and international geopolitics. And so now as we see this major transformation underway, I think it's quite appropriate to turn to Leonardo and, and, and gain from OPEC their views exactly uh, how they are interpreting, how they're analyzing and how their member states are, are managing and, and seeking to, uh, to deal with the consequences of this transformation that we're living through. So with that, I want to introduce Leonardo Sempertegui, who, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, legal counsel, the general counsel of OPEC. He's also an adjunct professor at the Georgetown Law Center in Washington, D.C. He has a Master of Laws from the University of Texas at Austin. Hook em horns, right? There you go. Uh, and, <laughs> he was a Fulbright scholar, and as I uh, probably uh, made you uh, understand earlier, he's from Ecuador. He's an Ecuadorian attorney by, by training. He's, he's got degrees from the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Ecuador and the Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar Ecuador. So, Leonardo, share with us just some, some broad thoughts and perspectives, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll have some questions and we'll have a, a conversation. I've got a bunch prepared here. Um, so, uh, so you've seen some of those, and let's see what our folks online can also, uh, uh, how they want to, uh, to, to question you and see what their thoughts are. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leonardo Sempertegui from Vienna and OPEC. Thanks again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My greetings from Vienna. Vienna. I, I, I thank you very much, much for the great introduction, introduction for the, the forward work. Presentation, presentation or conversation, you very well, very well said. said. And, and I appreciate the presentation of the ideas of the very past of your, 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 your constituency and your, your, your friends. friends. Uh, I hope I to see you as, as well when we, when we meet uh, in early September. So, to begin with, um, I will thought it was a good idea to give a, a small, a short overview on what OPEC is doing, uh, what OPEC, OPEC has been doing the last 59 years, and what has been doing in the last few years uh, for uh, information of all of us, and then uh, go more directly into the energy transition topic and discuss a few concepts and ideas that we, uh, we have in the organization and they are also being told around the world uh, often by our Secretary General uh, Mohamed Barkindo and by other members of the Secretariat, but apparently it, 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 keeps, it, it is not as well known as it could be. Uh, well, I, I don't want to refer to specific phenomena, but I believe that we could improve and always, in, in, always do better in, in sending our message to the world. So, very briefly, uh, Everybody is aware that OPEC exists for a long time. It was created in 1960 in Iraq between five countries initially. The organization nowadays has 14 countries that are full members of the, of the organization. Our organization works in the principle of one country, one vote, with no distinction whatsoever uh, because of the size or oil production or GDP of our countries. So uh, 14 countries sit together uh, in the Board of Governors and in the Conference of Ministers uh, to decide the matters uh, following our regulations and statutes. Our statute is uh, pretty straightforward. It's posted on the website and it, it has not been changed in the initial aims that were uh, defined in 1960, and OPEC has as principal aim 
the coordination and unification of petroleum policies of member countries and the determination of the best means for safeguarding their interests individually and collectively. And the organization shall uh, see, seek ways and means of ensuring the stabilization of prices in international oil markets with a view of eliminating harmful and unnecessary fluctuations. And due regard shall be given at all times to the interests of the producing nations and to the necessity of securing a steady income to the producing countries, an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to consuming countries, and a fair return on the capital to those investing in the petroleum industry. So it's very important to say this. The, the objective of OPEC has never been getting rich, getting richness or unfair richness, enrichment for the member countries, but rather ensure that the markets are sustainable. We all know in this conversation that an unstable energy market, like the one that we have been seeing, unfortunately, very often in the last decade, probably, is not a benefit for absolutely anyone around the world. Producers get hurt, consumers get hurt, investors cannot, uh, cannot make decisions based on reliable expectations or forecasts, so therefore, uh, this, this role, uh, we believe, is important. And we're not the only ones believing that. As you can imagine, member countries, um, or I'm sorry, countries that are not members of OPEC also appreciate the role of the organization. Oil producing countries that are not members of OPEC, which is an, a big number nowadays, also uh, have uh, an impact. A positive impact based on the decisions of the organization. So, having said so, probably I'm talking about the most known phase of OPEC, which gets, gets physical shape every six months when the ministers of the OPEC conference meet to discuss energy policies around the table here in Vienna. But OPEC is not only that, this is an institution of, of more than 135 officers that most of them are devoted to, for, to research and knowledge development. Uh, OPEC, I believe, is a great description of the organization is, is it's, a, it's somehow a think tank. Uh, information is received, analyzed, digested, and uh, reports are sent to the member countries uh, for them to inform in a better way their decisions. Uh, some topics are of interest of, more, of some countries more than, the, than others, and that is uh, completely natural, and with time priorities change as well. Uh, reviewing the, the files and the, and the history of the organization, we can see that the priorities and the discussion, the tone of the discussion has changed during the years. And in the past, it might have been uh, a bit more close, a bit more uh, protected, uh, focus on protecting only the or mainly the oil producing countries but nowadays there is a clear conscious that uh, an equilibrium is what is needed uh, and the, the role this role of OPEC uh, it's important to say it has been uh, executed by other entities in the past it's it's not a common known fact that the inspiration for OPEC was the uh, behavior of the Texas Railroad Commission in the early 20th century. Uh, so uh, that, that entity was clearly making a role similar to OPEC and then the international oil companies in the 30s, 40s were also uh, involved in, the, in an activity like, like ours. So this is known also in different studies, or so has been revealed in different analysis, that the existence of a, an entity like OPEC has been important for the development of the oil market as it is. So, OPEC has these two, two big activities, the research and knowledge generation for the member countries, and then serve as a platform for governments uh, for in the conversations regarding their energy policy decisions. I, before going into the topic uh, regarding energy transition, I just want to mention two more uh, uh, things. The first of all is that in 2016, seeing the uh, chaos in which the oil market was uh, in, uh, OPEC took a uh, landmark step to reach uh, 
other countries out of out of OPEC and try to work together towards uh, the stabilization of the oil market. This uh, is the group that is publicly known uh, as OPEC Plus. It's not an official name and it has never been named like that, but uh, OPEC uh, gets together with 10 more countries. So it's 24 countries nowadays sitting uh, every six months um, to dialogue about their energy policies and actions that they want to make or they consider necessary to make to keep oil market, oil market and energy market stable. And based on these conversations, based on this interaction with none of the countries, in July 2019, this is one month ago and a bit more, after a, a good time of conversation and and dialogue between OPEC and non-OPEC countries. Uh, the 24 countries signed a document called the Charter of Cooperation. And this Charter of Cooperation is a high-level commitment to be voluntarily implemented by the, the countries. And it's basically the creation of an intergovernmental uh, platform for dialogue among the countries in order to promote oil market stability, cooperation in technology and other areas for the benefit of oil producers, consumers and the global economy and to promote understanding among the countries about the fundamentals of the energy market, facilitate the dialogue between oil producing and consuming countries, relevant intergovernmental organizations and other actors of the energy industry, support energy policies for the long-term use of oil as a key component in the evolving energy mix as well as improving the environmental outlook and promote the strategies and technologies to advance the global oil and energy industry. So the dialogue and the conversation of OPEC with other actors keeps going and going and shows no reason to, to stop or there is no reason, apparent reason to stop. We believe that a strong conversation among all the players of the field will only bring good things. So this is the policy scenario in general uh, about, about the, the, the energy transition. I, I think it's important to make a few comments before we go into the, the Q&A. Uh, we, we have a publication that's probably known by everyone in this conversation, which is the World Oil Outlook. Uh, OPEC is preparing the, the launching of the uh, World Oil Outlook version of 2019. That's going to happen in around six to seven weeks. Um, all other outputs have been already released or are in the process of being released, IEA, BP, and, and some others, which we, institutions with, with which we uh, are in permanent conversation and, and in comparison to, 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 to see what the other is, is doing is, is also important. And this publication states the main uh, facts, assumptions, and analysis that OPEC has, has made. And it is very important to say that, as Jeremy was quoting at the very beginning, energy is in permanent transition. It is, it is not a stable industry. I believe that no, no healthy industry is, is permanently or perpetually stable or paralyzed or petrified in time. And obviously, energy in energy, that's not the case. And from, from our projections, uh, all the sources of energy that we know in the energy mix, except coal, will increase their uh, production in the next 20 years or 25 years. Obviously, some energies will increase more than others. The gas it is estimated to increase the most, renewables as well, nuclear a bit, hydroelectrical as well oil, of course. Uh, so, talking about an energy transition doesn't mean, from the perspective of OPEC, talking about phasing out oil or gas, because following the projections of economic growth that OPEC is analyzing or, or getting that are uh, in conformity with other analysts, the demand of uh, energy from the, for, from the public consumer all around the world will increase, especially in developing countries. We, we see a, a stagnation and even decrease of demand of energy in OECD countries, but uh, developing countries, China and India, are leading an important push for increase. 
that is that is one fact that that we see as questionable in the sense that it is what the models are, are giving us a result around the world. It will be interesting to see if there is a different perspective. And then it becomes probably what's the second most important difference, which is uh, that there is not, we don't see a problem with fossil fuels per se, because hydrocarbons are not the problem. The problem is, is, is carbon, is, is, the, is the chemical element that is creating a tension and a problem regarding climate change. So I believe, and there, there is efforts, we, uh, there is efforts all around the world that are being made, in which probably we should all uh, work more in intensely now that we are seeing the results of, of human activity around the world. Uh, we, will, we, we should work further, private sector, public sector, uh, multi-intergovernmental organizations and others, into fighting the problem of how we solve the environmental pro, uh, situation, challenges, how do we solve the environmental challenges, but at the same time taking care of the energy poverty uh, situation all around the world. From our estimates, almost one billion people doesn't have access to uh, reliable energy sources today, and that number, unfortunately, is not projected to decrease mainly because the population will keep increasing in developing countries. So, it, it sounds a bit simplistic, I have to be honest, to say that uh, it, it is just a matter of closing uh, the production of oil and gas and other sources, and that will be replaced with, with the renewable energies, or what is being called so far renewable energies, because uh, the, the growth of such energies apparently will not be enough to match the needs of energy of the planet. So there is a policy question there that it probably can take us even further. This is a more of a personal opinion. It can take us even further in the sense of we might even have to, to, to rethink as societies what is the concept of development, because if we're using resources energy and other resources at a level in which it is not sustainable, well, probably we, we, we need to rethink what development means, because development is now measured in some specific economic factors or some, or through some specific economic analysis that uh, probably were, were feeding uh, 50 years ago, 75 years ago, but nowadays uh, we, we see a different reality. And we will have to make tough choices, and, and we all know that. And that is why OPEC is not shying away from the conversation regarding climate change. OPEC has been involved in the UNFCCC conversations for a long time now with the direct participation of our Secretary General, which, by the way, is a very knowledgeable person in climate change matters based on his previous experience. So the, the important, the important uh, as, as we said, as I said, the beginning, we believe that the important uh, issue is to discuss among all the, part, the, the, the relevant stakeholders about of the problem or the challenge as, as climate change is, and find solutions that are realistic, applicable, and at the same time effective. Otherwise, uh, and this is again uh, more of a personal comment, uh, the sensation is that uh, we, we might feel that we're doing something because countries sign and ratify the Paris Agreement, but eventually that is only giving us an impression that something positive is happening while the commitments of the countries are not uh, where they should be uh, to stop uh, the problem to go out of hand. Of course, from the perspective of member countries of OPEC, the, 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 the visions uh, are, are different. You can imagine having such a different a membership as we have with Saudi Arabia as the biggest uh, oil exporter in the planet, uh, sometimes the biggest oil producer depending on the day or the month, and, and countries like, like Ecuador that produce half a million barrels of oil per day or other countries that produce a bit less. We have a 
variety, uh, a, a big variety of situations. And some countries have decided to tackle the, the problem in one way or another, but the ratification process of the Paris Agreement shows that there is indeed a preoccupation, and we can see it is not a secret or a confidential fact that some of these countries are engaging deeply in uh, projects uh, regarding energy beyond oil. They keep their own production, of course, because it's, it's uh, an important business and it's important for the global economy, supply of oil, but at the same time the development is also uh, considering electricity through a glow, a solar uh, power, solar generation, wind generation, among others. But, as I said before, this depends on the priorities, capacities, and uh, decisions made by individual countries in which OPEC does not participate. OPEC, as I said before, provides information and knowledge for countries to make their own decisions uh, regarding energy policy. All this uh, complicated recipe gets only seasoned, gets only more flavory because of, of the non-energy related tensions that are created around the planet. Some of them real, some of them artificial. Uh, for, for in one hand, for example, uh, the, the, the constant uh, commercial and trade conflicts around the planet only make the market nervous and, and this, uh, this sensation of the market definitely translates into the oil industry instability. So the, the, the decisions made by OPEC countries are quite uh, relevant to, 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 to keep uh, some market stability in a, in a time where we see that there are forces like trade disputes that are mainly artificial that are bringing tension uh, again and again. It appears that it will never stop, or it won't stop for a good time at least. And uh, obviously, uh, these trade wars and other phenomena bring a slowdown of the economy, of the economy of the global economy, which also affects uh, the outcome of the energy industry and the oil industry in particular. So, it is a very complex scenario in which we have to solve several problems at the same time, and our analysis is that they might be, or they might look co as competing problems, uh, but, but as, as a planet we simply cannot afford to, to solve one and leave the other unattended. Uh, that's, that's, the, that's how the organization sees things uh, in, in the last years, and therefore it is becoming a more and more engaged global player in the uh, energy poverty and uh, in environmental uh, discussion uh, around the world. So, Jeremy, having said so, I believe that we uh, have a good round for discussion and conversation.
take care. Indeed, as, as I mentioned before, I think that the, the definition that you quoted at the beginning was probably the best way to, to, to phrase how we see the phenomenon here, which is, uh, of course, there are other sources of energy e e erupting in the, in the scenario, and these are more than welcome uh, in the sense that if we will have to serve uh, the energy world, uh, the world energy demand only based on oil, we will have serious problems today uh, because the planet demands far more energy than what oil can, can uh, present. So uh, the, the, we, we don't see that uh, the transition indeed seems like other, seems to us like other sources are coming to, to fill the gap of demand that exists nowadays. But oil still remains a, a relevant source in, in the sense of it's not disappearing. Obviously, it's becoming a smaller piece of the pie. That's natural using mathematics. But beyond that, uh, our forecast, which is also public, as I said before, is that the production of oil will have to increase uh, from approximately 100 million barrels of oil per day today to 117 million barrels in uh, 2040. So therefore, uh, if energy transition means uh, oil uh, going away from the energy mix, uh, I feel that neither OPEC nor uh, other agencies will will agree with that with that analysis. So let me you you sort of answered the follow up question that I wanted to pose, and it's something that uh, we definitely want to talk about in Madrid. We've talked about it this year at the La Jolla conference here at the institute, and that's the the question of how much oil for how long. And so I, I think you you've lined up some statistics and trends out to twenty forty, but but answer that specific question. So so uh, at least through twenty forty, but then and then how much longer after that? What's what do you see? I mean, from from what I, I we have as information, the the the, the world oil outlook of 20, 2018, we we see the, an an increase up to twenty fourteen. From there on, I'm not really aware of how it's seen, but um, I I have to be honest with, with you in this analysis. I I'm not too concerned about how it will look after twenty forty because we have far more urgent problems to solve. So um, we, will, we will take care of that, and, and probably the forecast will start showing things in the next five years if there will be a slowdown of oil demand around the world. But uh, even so, imagine in that case, which is not what uh, our models are seeing, in that case, oil is not simply going to disappear. I, mean, I, I see, and this is me as a lawyer speaking, I see other kind of, of, of issues that could be raised around the planet that could uh, bring a different scenario. Uh, but because of natural decline of demand, because probably peak demand might be the scenario where we will be discussing, uh, I don't see oil. Well, there is, there is no possibility of oil simply vanishing. However, we have to clarify that this analysis is made considering a normal evolution of technology and a normal evolution of regulation and based on the policies and agreements that exist nowadays. If in 10 years countries meet again and decide something completely different, well, things, things might change, definitely. And, and, and we're aware of that. We're conscious that the, the scenario is quite fluid nowadays. Exactly. And, and so there's a word that, that we love here in California. Well, we, we, we love to use it about economies and its disruptors. And I think that's what you're alluding to with these kinds of discussions of projections and outlooks. Um, it's hard to, to, uh, to, to, to include in any kind of analysis a future disruption because that's exactly what it does is it disrupts the status quo. So I, I guess the question is, what, what do, do you see as sort of maybe not disruptors, because those are difficult to, to identify, but what are therefore the key elements from either your vantage and perspective as, as, a, as a lawyer or more importantly from OPEC in terms of what's driving the energy transition? Is it a purely climate? Is it, is it something that uh, the, 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 the cost of oil? What, what, what do you see as the key elements driving the energy transition? I mean, I, I, you, you mentioned two, and I would like to, to, to start with those two. Uh, I, I don't think cost 
is, is, is a problem. Of course, price will always be an issue and it's, it's funny for me to see forecasts uh, of oil price of the past and see how they have missed the target so badly. And, and, and I am yet to find a forecast that was somehow accurate. And, and I can understand that. I mean, there are so many factors that we can simply not imagine for the future. So, but at the same time, it, we all know, we're all familiar with the discussion in, in the 80s, 90s, probably, where we were thinking about big oil and when the oil is going to run away and run out, etc. But uh, frankly, the reserves of oil are abundant. Uh, more and more countries are being added to the list of oil producers and uh, will be added in the future to the list of oil exporters. So uh, uh, there is a resource that ensures an adequate supply and probably that will be the best way to uh, have a reasonable price of oil, uh, including uh, or insisting in the fact that is no one's interest to have an artificially high oil, oil price. It's, it's, it's natural that, that that's, that's not the case. But uh, I don't see that as a main driver. Uh, of course, environmental issues, climate change will be the most, the most pressing issue from the policy perspective. And, and I believe that, that the reaction in that case is, is, is adequate in the sense that the conversation about, as I said before, the conversation about taking oil out of off the table is, is not viable today. So therefore, we, we need to learn how we can live with the benefits of oil and how we can counteract the, the, the problems that, that uh, hydrocarbons create. So uh, probably the disruption of technology that I would love to see and we would love to see and that we have to work more and more to encourage is um, technology to, to capture carbon. And we know that there are progresses, that there, there is some progress around the world. Uh, hopefully that, that progress will be Will be better and we need to provide the conditions and you are in probably the best place uh, Jeremy to, 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 to imagine this we have to provide the right conditions for this technology disruption uh, to be to be there and, and I am very honest with, with you on the audience now I believe that international oil companies have a big interest on finding that solution because they want to be uh, to still be in the oil business or to give the, lo the, the oil business a longer lifespan. If they have an interest, states owning the resource, owning the oil, have a far bigger interest for that to happen. So therefore, uh, the, 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 the provision or, or the facilitation of these conditions for technology disruption, positive technology disruption for oil to happen, is, is something that we have to take care of uh, more and more. Well, thank you for uh, for for uh, the, uh, the the props to California and where where the institute's based here. Uh, so so let me let me take there's a, there's a whole host of of, of tangents I want to go into with you on some of the things you've just said here, uh, technology innovation and and obviously some of the the technology. But there was a question I think that we should weave in here because it it comes back to something exactly you just said. So this, the specific question is, what is the role of, of oil producing countries, I mean, in this case, the OPEC member states, in the effort to reduce emissions? Hmm. It, it, interesting question and, and, and a big question. I, I, I believe there are, there are a, few, a few things that we could do from the macro to, 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 to micro level. First of all, OPEC is deeply committed to uh, strengthening multilateral efforts. Uh, we, we believe that unilateral action, unilateral decisions can only be damaging for this strong network that has brought prosperity to the planet, which is called multilateralism. So, uh, and, and, and as you can imagine for us, it has not been easy. Again, I'm not telling secrets when I'm, uh, when I'm telling, when I'm talking about the differences that our member countries have uh, had in the past in specific times, or currently have, uh, but nevertheless, the organization has been able to provide a, a safe space, a forum in which political differences were left aside and a specific technical interest were tackled. So uh, OPEC is, is in, in its global capacity uh, reaching more and more spaces to encourage these efforts, a multilateral effort. Then going to the country's level, of course, there are uh, 
a plethora of actions where where a reduction of emissions could happen, and this is uh, this is something that has to start from the from the oil industry. I, I believe that it's, it's everybody in here might be familiar with the different efforts that are being done uh, by state-owned companies and uh, private contractors, of course, to reduce the emissions of the oil production itself. There you have methane and of course carbon, okay, CO2, that are being reduced with several projects or through several projects with the support of another other multilateral organizations. That is one. But then there are other issues that can be tackled. But from my perspective, the, 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 the role is simple. The state, the state is, is not the main uh, generator, direct generator of emissions, obviously, in any place, but the private sector. So state has to provide for, for regulations uh, and parameters and standards, and then the private sector is the one that has to comply with them. So this is also a delicate equilibrium that we have in the, in the uh, climate change agreements and the commitments, that the state makes commitments, the governments, different states, uh, go, uh, different countries make commitments towards the international community, but it's not necessarily on the uh, government's hands to, to, to comply these commitments. They, they, are, they involve deeply the private, private sector. So there you have mm -hmm. lots, of, lots of options, uh, Jeremy, from uh, uh, energy generation by other sources, uh, energy efficiency measures, uh, other efficiency measures, not only regarding energy, but regarding the use of uh, lots of uh, good, goods and services that, that we use as human beings that in their production the energy consumption is enormous. So all these policy decisions are uh, relevant. Now we are seeing uh, 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 an environmental challenge towards plastics, for example. This is uh, nowadays something that's in the newspapers almost every day. It, that has also an impact in, in, in oil. And probably most of the people don't even think about that, but it's fine. I mean, we, we need to make this planet viable. We will need to change some behaviors, and we will all have to adapt. Well, I, I think okay. So let's let's continue the policy debate. Just to clarify one thing, I want to you know obviously with the Paris Agreement and the, and the and the approach that 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 put in place, you have countries making what what are you know determined contributions to reduce emissions NDCs as the acronym goes and so there wow. there is there is a, a a state a nation uh a commitment to to put in place policies to seek target reductions again i i, you, I understand what you mean about the private sector and and then the, the final point is those are voluntary reduction mm -hmm. targets but so let's go to something that's that's heavily debated. I think it'd be interesting to throw into the middle of this conversation of over over policy and and policy debates and the role of of all of the stakeholders in this, uh, and that's carbon carbon tax. Um, you know, you, you made a you made a very strong emphatic point that it's not hydrocarbons; it's the carbon. It's the it's it's the output of the hydrocarbons. Um, so what about carbon tax? Where where is OPEC or what is the uh, the member states' general thoughts and opinions um, on carbon tax, because we've seen in the international oil companies uh, a bit of evolution on the role of a carbon tax. So I'm curious to get your thoughts, because I think this is a key piece uh, of the policy debate that's underway around the world. Uh, yes, I, I, I think that uh, it is quite a relevant sub, uh, subject to be discussed. And as you very well mentioned, international oil companies have been uh, talking about the issue and they have been evolving in their views about the issue. We, we are in permanent conversation with international oil companies and, and we know how the processes are. And, and, and probably in our case, it's, it's a task to develop and a task to, to improve a bit further in the sense that there is, as, uh, as I said at the beginning, OPEC does not impose any views uh, or no decision that might be made in OPEC is a, 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 a obligatory application of, of the member countries. So therefore what we, what we do inside the organization regarding these matters is rather studying, analyzing the, the pros and cons, how the, the tax is working. We know that the tax is working in 50 jurisdictions around the planet 
some states, so the US, other states in other places, some countries, in almost all continents you have examples of carbon tax in many ways, in, in very in, in, in very different different ways. So what OPEC is is analyzing the different the scenarios, the different possibilities and providing that information to member countries for their decisions. So if, if you ask me about the specific stance uh, from OPEC in the matter, it is something that, that is not that is not here, and I am not. I'm not sure if I should say it is not yet here, because you, you pointed to the uh, evolution or to the uh, change in the in the analysis from the international oil companies, and I am not saying that that might not be the case as well for us, in the sense that it is an organization that is trying to keep pace with with all the. Uh, fast evolution around the world, and, and therefore it's a, it's a topic that probably will be discussed more and more. It, it is also very important to say that OPEC statute is, is wide in, in terms of the kind of topics in, in which we can, we can dig and, and we can talk about. It has traditionally been linked with, with, with market and with uh, stability, etc. But, but our statute doesn't have doesn't have that limitation. And, and for us, it's very clear that maybe in the past, stability uh, could have been the main challenge or the main issue to tackle. Maybe today, the main issues to tackle are, are different. And that's, that, that's the, the, the process of, of, of reflection in which OPEC is permanently embarked. Well, I, I know that was a, a, a difficult question given you know where things are. So I appreciate the the thoughts on that. In, 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 in point of fact, I think you're being very open, and, and we greatly appreciate that. Um, there's a question here from Guillermo Zuniga, who, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, is a commissioner. So we have a uh, a regulator uh, from Mexico joining us and in, in posing a question here about. Uh, I, I mentioned some of the the change and evolution in international oil companies when it comes to carbon tax uh, policy. Mm -hmm. uh, Here's here's a question that in some ways encapsulates everything we're talking about today in this webinar, and in in in, in addition the the the, the central uh, discussion point of the Madrid Energy Conference in September, and that is, he says some international oil companies have started to expand their business activities into renewable sources of energy. Do you think this can be a general trend in the global oil industry? Thank you for the question. I appreciate it very much and. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy uh, this, this comes now because it's a permanent topic of discussion and, and for me personally a topic of research uh, from the academic perspective. It, we have been following and I have been following even before joining OPEC this uh, transformation of, of the international oil companies that are uh, talking about uh, renewable energy and are investing heavily in renewable energy uh, in the last few years. It, an, an analysis or, or, or something that, that we could we could a reflection that we could make is that probably that model fits uh, state-owned companies and probably doesn't. It, 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 it will also depend on the on the case-to-case -case basis. And uh, for example, I I can be I can be uh, open with you as well in the sense that uh, it's not a member country, but it's our host country. Uh, our host country, Austria, has uh, state owned, well, it was a state owned company, OMV, uh, that now has uh, important investments, private investments. The Austrian government, I believe, retains a minority, uh, minority share. But they decided instead of diversifying towards renewable energy, they decided to focus on petrochemicals because they believe that the business is in there in the future. So we were discussing with, with some people in the organization these and we have been analyzing the issue and the diversification could be in, in these two ways from the energy business because this is an important preoccupation for, for OPEC for our member countries is if we imagine that at some point on the, on the, along the road oil might not be as relevant, relevant as it is nowadays well, our countries will will be will suffer some some challenges from the economic perspective, and therefore it's important to invest in the future business when you have important royalties or important revenues from the current business. 
So one option is renewable energy and how can that or how how that can be developed. Or the other could be petrochemical, which is somehow related to the oil industry. And we see, and it's not a secret again, that some of our member countries are investing heavily in petrochemicals. And um, they believe that the that the future is there. And well, I I I wish them good luck and, and, and we will see. But I believe that some other countries might decide to engage more in the energy in general business. And 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 I wouldn't like to take Ecuador as an example, but of course I'm very familiar with, with it. And and you guys or you visited Ecuador recently, and and obviously uh, in the last 10 to 15 years, electricity was very much promoted, and uh, in, the increase in the oil uh, in the oil, oil production has been uh, close to zero. It's basically keeping it flat in the country, but the the, the the resources were going towards the electricity sector. So well. Maybe the country is trying to sh switch from one business to the other because now Ecuador has a spare capacity of electricity that is trying to allocate around the around the continent. So uh, these these are the options, and as I said at the beginning, we study, we analyze, we reflect, and then we pass to the member countries. Decisions are are not made here. No, no, understood, and and so I appreciate the. I mean, this is this is a key point about the. The transition, I mean, just to take one or two companies, Equinor and Shell, I mean, they have made it just like you say, there's no secrets from what you guys are doing, nor have they. In fact, they've been very ambitious, even setting executive remuneration tied to remissions reductions and these kinds of things. Uh, we're, we're, we're running out of time. This always happens where we, we get into such a wonderful conversation, discussion that the time flies by. I wanted to, to have at least one specific question about Latin America. Ecuador, which you, uh, where your home and where you come from and, and you represent, uh, is one of two Latin American countries, uh, obviously the other Venezuela and OPEC. So if you wouldn't mind taking a, a minute and, and just giving your thoughts, whether it's personally, whether it's as an Ecuadorian, whether it's from OPEC, in terms of Latin America, um, in terms of the oil outlook and vis-a-vis and, and -vis the global oil market, um, and, and sort of what role do you expect Latin America to play in the coming years in, in terms of the global projections? And you, you, Just real simply, you know, by 2040 of that 117 million barrels a day um, uh, target, uh, what, what's, what's Latin America going to be producing? And then we'll wrap up with one final question. So uh, just thoughts on Latin America's oil sector. Uh, that, that's my pleasure, of course. Uh, I'm trying to find the, 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 the information that you requested me now <laughs> regarding the production of Latin America. I'll try to, I'll try to find it around here. But uh, before, before saying so, of course, Latin America in, in OPEC, uh, I, it's, it's a region that is not as uh, represented in the terms of number of countries as Africa and uh, Middle East, that is that's just pure numbers. And, uh, uh, well, unfortunately, the, 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 uh, and this is a rather personal approach. The situation of Venezuela uh, is, uh, well, uh, it's, it's different than it was uh, 20, 30 years ago also in the organization. Uh, obviously, Venezuela has different challenges to tackle nowadays. Uh, from the from various perspectives, but also in the petroleum industry, the, the production uh, decline and, and the, the technical complications. But also, they, they have to tackle one issue that I was referring before, which is sanctions and and sanctions that definitely do not solve any any problem, at least from the perspective of the oil industry. So that is that is to say something uh, regarding uh, regarding the current members of of OPEC. Regarding other uh, countries, we are closely following countries that are that will have interesting perspectives, and not only perspectives but also reality. Mexico, Argentina, and Brazil are uh, countries uh, with which uh, that, that, that we that we monitor constantly. The sources are public, and, and of course we, we research on them. Mexico is a country uh, that is part of the Declaration of Cooperation that I mentioned before as well as the, of the Charter of Cooperation, this new project in which we are embarked uh, with 24 countries. And we can, we can see that Latin America can become a more, more and more 
a relevant player in the global energy industry. Also, uh, let's not forget that in this case we're not talking only about oil, we're talking about enormous reserves of uh, natural gas that Argentina has, uh, for example, and that exporting these, these resources are giving a, a bigger voice of, uh, to the region in the global energy outlook. Uh, let's see, it's, it's very important to see how how uh, the development in, in Brazil goes with the fields uh, that are in, in prospective development for a few years now. Yeah. We will see if that materializes because that could be uh, also a game changer in the in the energy perspective from the from the region. I'm 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 sorry, and I will have to to, to leave that for for Madrid probably the, the figure that Opus has for. Uh, Latin America 2040 production. I'm certain that's here, but uh, I have to be honest, this document has 400 no. something no. pages no. and it's not my daily, my daily, <laughs> my daily Bible. I, I, I produce it often, but obviously my, my work is focused more on regulatory policies and, and partnerships uh, for the organization. So. I, yeah, I, I will have to excuse myself on that specific uh, piece of information, Jeremy. No, no, that was a bit unfair to push you for a number. But uh, I would add to that uh, what you mentioned about some of those countries, Guyana, and perhaps uh, you, you as an organization are in discussions with the Guyanese government about the possibility of Guyana joining OPEC. But that's another question we'll leave for Madrid because we're almost out of time. And I want to wrap up with sort of a, a very direct, and everyone who's uh, been to our events, especially here in La Jolla, but then we started in some of the regional events as well. I always like to end the panels with a yes or no question. I won't do that to you today, Leonardo, but I do want to ask a pretty specific question that has a, a short answer to it, um, sort of a one word answer. And that is, you know, coming all the way back to where we started in the energy transition vis-a-vis -vis OPEC in, in, in the member states. Um, the question is, do the, do the countries, the member states view the global energy transition as an opportunity or threat? Um, I know. I I'm here that, at the end. <laughs> if, if, if you if you let me phrase this adequately, I believe that uh, the view is evolving from a threat to, to an opportunity. That's a great answer, and that's a perfect way to end it. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone here online in Madrid in just a few weeks. Leonardo will be expounding even further on many of these and other thoughts, and we'll pin down on the number of Latin American barrels per day uh, in 25 years or or, plus or so. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Leonardo. Really appreciate your time. Look forward to seeing you. You see on the screen here the reminder about the Madrid Energy Conference. Let me also just make sure folks who are joining us, please keep following us on social media. We've got all the LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram handles there for you. Thank you again, Leonardo Sempertegui from... OPEC, the General Legal Counsel. Thank you all for joining us from all over the world. And uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you.